we're going to start in a minute. Okay, let's start. So, uh, hi everyone. My name is uh, Jeremy Julio. I work on uh, building a full-time quantum processor with cat qubits with the team at the uh, Alison Bob Paris. I'll be the chair for your session. So I would like to thank the organizers for putting up this nice workshop. Uh, although I missed uh, giving talks in the living room of a large Airbnb house in the beach in the Byron Bay, I must admit it's really nice to have that many people in the room today. The first speaker of the session is uh, Philippe Campagny Bach, who's a researcher in the quantum team at Enria in Paris, and he'll be talking about robust quantum resurrection of GKB qubits. Hi, everyone. Thanks, uh, Jeremy, for the introduction. And uh, of course, thank you to the organizers. I'm, uh, can you hear me correctly? No. No? Yeah. Let's try. Like this? Okay. Let's try like this. So, uh, yeah, thanks again for uh, the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, let's go like this. It's a pleasure to be here, uh, even if it's not uh, actually Byron Bay, but uh, Boulder is, uh, is beautiful too. Uh, even if I must say, it's going to cost me a lot to come to this conference because, to tell you the truth, uh, today's is uh, both my kids' uh, birthday. <laughs> So it's not so much that they mind me coming here, but uh, the older one, so we were both born on the 20th of June, uh, three years apart. And the older <laughs> one, Leo, here is, uh, has become a tough bargainer. And I think he, uh, he, could, he could feel a, a sliver of guilt in me and uh, used it to, uh, to ask for me to bring back gifts. Uh, so first he asked me for packs of candies. So that's easy enough. Uh, second, he asked me for a dinosaur puzzle. That's also easy enough. Uh, actually, I was the one incepting the ID because I have already bought the, the dinosaur puzzle. <laughs> but the third one is going to be much more tricky to come by. It's a pink plush whale with glitter. So I wanted to take the opportunity of this talk to ask, please, please, if anyone has seen one of those in town, just let me know, okay? So, uh, more seriously, uh, today I'm going to obviously tell you about uh, bosonic error correction and in particular about uh, the GKP code. And uh, I'm going to essentially describe two protocols that we propose to perform robust uh, error correction of GKP qubits. And what I mean by robust is that we will be looking for uh, exponential scalings of uh, errors. Errors should be exponentially suppressed versus some uh, system figure of merit. So to give you an idea of where these uh, scalings come from, I have prepared uh, an introduction about uh, a simpler code as a GKP code that some of you may know. Uh, it is known as a CAT code. Uh, and uh, well, it's, it's going to be a bit redundant with Liang's talk, but uh, essentially uh, uh, you can define the, the CAT states as uh, displaced coherent states that are distant in, uh, in phase space, plus alpha and minus alpha. And this distance is uh, what will provide robustness uh, against bit flips. Uh, what matters is not so much the, the physical distance between the two states uh, of this oscillator, but rather distance uh, in the sense of, uh, from the point of view of noise. And if you consider a dominant uh, noise channels such as photon loss, uh, quadrature noise, that, uh, that space space uh, displacement, uniform displacements that Liang described, uh, pure diffusing, and actually any noise process that couples to your oscillator via finite order polynomials in A and A DAG, and here F and G are. Uh, noisy process, either quantum or classical, this will entail continuous phase space trajectories of your state. So that means that it will take time for your state to come from minus alpha to plus alpha or vice versa. And so bit flips take time, which gives you opportunity to perform error correction. And to be a bit more quantitative, here I have plotted uh, the wave functions uh, for, the, the, for various uh, cat code states. And uh, they all display uh, along the Q quadrature, uh, well, Gaussian blood, uh, which are centered in square root of two alpha for this uh, particular coordinates Q and P. Uh, they have a unit variance, so that means that these blobs partially overlap. Uh, and yet for sufficiently la large alpha, this overlap is really small. So uh, if I prepare the state minus alpha, for instance, very close to minus D state, 
And if I decode right away with the simplest decoding scheme, which consists in asking whether the state is left or right of Q equal to zero, uh, well, I will get the, the correct, the expected answer with very high probability. Uh, the probability of an apparent phase flip, uh, phase, uh, sorry, uh, bit flip, is going to be exponentially small in alpha squared. And the strength of the, GK, of the, the CAD code is uh, that if now you consider a noise, so you prepare your state and you wait for a small time delta t, uh, what will a noise do? And in particular, quadrature noise here, quadrature noise is very simple. It gives you nice analytical formulas, is that it will slightly broaden the states. Uh, but uh, the, the, the probability for a bit flip is still exponentially small uh, in alpha squared. Uh, now, the limit of the CAD code, as you probably already know, is that it does not protect against uh, the other type of error here, phase flips. Uh, you can understand it because uh, if you look at the, at the plus and minus six uh, wave functions uh, in the peak quadrature, uh, they display these uh, oscillations at interference uh, fringes. And the frequency of these fringes is going to increase with alpha square, uh, which makes them more sensitive to uh, small shifts uh, along peak. And you can show quantitatively that, uh, that the phase, uh, phase flip rate is going to increase linearly uh, with alpha square. So which, uh, this brings me to uh, the GKP code, uh, which has the advantage to put uh, bit and phase flip on an equal footing. So GKP states uh, were introduced by, uh, uh, initially by Gottesman, Kitayev, and Preskill in a, a somehow idealized setting of uh, infinitely extending states in, a, in phase space. And the plus and minus these states are uh, uh, superpositions of uh, displaced, periodically spaced position states. Okay? And they are shifted uh, from one another by alpha period. And well, you probably already know the story uh, with the proper choice of period, which is a two square root of pi. It's a parapeter I will call eta throughout my talk. Uh, if you, you plot the same states, but in the P quadrature, you get uh, also uh, sort of combs, but with twice as many teeth. And if now you consider superposition of plus Z and minus Z, Z that's uh, plus X and minus X, uh, you will get these wave functions in P that are perfectly symmetric uh, with the Q wave functions for plus and minus Z. This is very practical because it means that if you find a way uh, to prevent uh, bit flips by doing something along the Q quadrature, you just need to take your protocol and uh, to swap Q and P, and you will also uh, prevent phase flip. So the GKP code is also a stabilizer, stabilizer code, which uh, gives you a, a, a way to, uh, to perform error correction. These, uh, these stabilizers are modular functions of Q and P, uh, originally introduced as this uh, exponential of I eta Q and I eta P. Uh, there are alternative definitions. I actually really like this one. Uh, which, uh, which tells you that uh, you can use as stabilizers uh, modular uh, position and momentum operators. So that's Q or P modulo to pi over eta. And this uh, really tells you uh, how you can perform error correction by measuring Q and P modulo to pi over eta. You can detect small shifts of the states uh, and correct for them without revealing the logical qubit because they have the same uh, modular coordinates, uh, Q and P modulo to pi over eta. And finally, let me introduce the logical operators. Uh, here I'm using a slightly different definition from, uh, from GKP. I'm adding this sine of cos eta over 2q and sine of cos eta over 2p. And the reason for this is that with this definition, uh, if you prepare plus z, well, of course, you have a, the z operator, which has a value of plus 1. But if you display slightly the plus z state, the Z operator here is like a decoding operator. It's still plus one because you can perfectly recover your initial state. But if you displace it a bit further away so that eta Q becomes larger than pi over two, uh, then uh, you're lost. You will decode your, your, your state as minus Z and this uh, Z operator abruptly uh, switches sign. Okay? So that's for the, the infinite energy states. Uh, you can normalize them uh, by applying, uh, well, mathematically, you apply this uh, Gaussian envelope operator here. And what it, it will give to your, uh, to, your periodically, uh, to, your, to your periodic state is that it will provide a normalizing envelope uh, with standard deviation eta over epsilon. It will also uh, broaden the, the, the peaks. They are not infinitely narrow any longer. They are, they are, the, the peak standard deviation is epsilon over eta. Uh, you can normalize the same way the stabilizers so, that, so as to get exact expressions for the stabilizers of the finite energy code. 
And for the logical operators, well, you could probably do the same, but I will keep uh, this definition of the, 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 of the same stabilizer, uh, logical operator that for the, the infinite energy code. The, the reason is simple, is simply because, well, we know how to measure those, uh, whereas measuring uh, finite energy equivalent is gonna be probably much harder. And with this definition, uh, you get a very uh, analogous behavior to the, to the CAD code I have been describing. So if you prepare, for instance, a code state plus or minus Z uh, and decode immediately, you will have, uh, even without noise, you will have a small probability of error, okay, but which is exponentially sp small versus uh, sigma square, uh, which is the, the peak uh, width here. And now if you add on top of this quadrature noise, which is like displacing randomly, having your state diffuse in phase space, uh, it will broaden a bit the peaks. Uh, you go from sigma to sigma tilde, uh, and this uh, will also impact the, the bit and phase speed rate, but you retain the exponential scalings as long as sigma tilde is not, uh, is not too big. So of course, compared to the, the CAD code, we, we, we lost something very important is that we don't have the scaling parameter alpha. Uh, we cannot make the peaks further away. The only thing that we can do is try to uh, reduce their width. Uh, and the only way to do this is, uh, is to, uh, to uh, reduce kappa delta t. So that means that we should uh, either have a better system with like less uh, losses, less noise, uh, or uh, to increase the uh, error correction clock rate. Okay, so now I'm gonna dive in uh, into the, 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 the more pragmatic, uh, practical way of, uh, of doing uh, error correction. And for uh, a good half of the talk, I will mostly focus on infinite energy code because it's much harder, uh, easier to, to understand. And I will argue at the end that most of the results can be transposed to the finite energy group. So the way you, uh, you, you perform, uh, you, you measure the stabilizers, um, well, uh, it's, a, it's a process known as phase estimation, which was originally introduced also by Kitayev in 1995. What has not been introduced by Kitayev, I don't know. He was always uh, at the origin of, of stuff I, I keep finding. Uh, and in the GKP setting, uh, experimentally, it was realized in, uh, in, uh, in Jonathan's home group uh, for the first time, uh, and then we also uh, used a similar protocol uh, at Yale. Uh, so the idea is to have uh, your target oscillator that will host a GKP qubit uh, coupled to a two-level system, for us it was a transman, uh, via a controllable uh, Rabi-like interaction. Here it's, it's an interaction which is quadrature times Pauli operator of the transman. And what this, uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, interaction does is that it will rotate your transmon around the z-axis of the block sphere condition on the value of Q. So we can represent this uh, like uh, for uh, what it does on a transmon prepared uh, here in plus six in the block sphere. Uh, when your, 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 your oscillator is in a GKP state is that the, the block vector will rotate at a speed that depends on Q. But if you time the interaction well, all the block uh, vectors will recombine so you are hiding the which peak information, okay? Uh, and now if you start from a slightly displaced state, uh, all the peaks will also recombine, uh, but uh, this block vector, there will be an angle that, uh, onto which you have mapped uh, the error syndrome from the, the GKP state. So now how do you actually uh, use this information? What do you measure? How do you, uh, how do you uh, put it back, feed it back to your system? So there are several ways of doing this, uh, more or less elaborate. Uh, probably the simplest one is uh, the one we used uh, at Yale. Uh, so the idea was simply to, to measure the transmon along the y-axis, okay, which uh, is a measurement that will uh, yield more information than along the, 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 the x-axis. And uh, if you and to apply a, a simple proportional feedback, so feedback based only on this measurement outcome, and, uh, and the idea is the following. If you measure minus y, which is more probable here, uh, you interpret this as meaning that the state is probably right, uh, displaced to the right, and you apply a feedback by delta to the left. Okay? But you may also uh, measure with a smaller probability plus y, in which case you apply a feedback kick to the right. So in that case, you, you, you decenter your GKP, uh, your GKP state. But if you look at the effect over many rounds, and assuming that this uh, kickback delta is small, uh, what will happen is that uh, you will. Uh, preserve the periodicity here of the GKP state, which will start moving according to a random walk, okay, plus uh, left, right, left, right. But this, uh, the steps are biased towards the origin. So in a, in a continuous version of this random walk, you get a diffusion constant proportional to, uh, to delta square 
what I call T round here is a time of a round. A round is an interaction uh, with the, the, the ancilla, a measurement and the feedback, and a drift velocity, uh, which also depends on delta. And when you combine these two and assuming that delta is small, uh, you can show that uh, in steady state, you will get a peak width here, uh, which is proportional to delta. Okay, so if you want narrow peaks, you want a small uh, feedback, a small delta. But you can also show that the confinement rate onto this peak uh, depends on delta. So you, there will be a trade-off between the two. And to be more quantitative, if you add in your noise model a quadrature noise of your oscillator, uh, what quadrature noise does is that it increases the, the diffusion constant. So now your peak has this formula and you have an optimal delta value, uh, which is a square root of kappa t, actually. Uh, phase slips of the transmon, uh, you can also take them into account very easily. It's like, a, uh, essentially what they will do is that we will just apply, it's like a, they will mess up with your, your readout and you will apply a kickback in the wrong direction. Uh, so this will decrease slightly the drift velocity, but it's really not dramatic. Uh, what I call PNF here is a, is a one minus the, the phase flip probability. Um, and uh, so here we are correcting, uh, preparing the Q quadrature, that's error correction along Q, but you can also uh, alternate uh, RQ round where you, 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 you correct for Q errors and RP rounds where you correct for P errors to get this, uh, this picture of phase space uh, where you get uh, uh, like a drift velocity pinning down your state to the center and the diffusion constant. And uh, here it's a very classical picture because I, uh, I have been, I'm showing phase space, but uh, along these modular coordinates here, and these two modular coordinates commute. So all the classical intuition about uh, 2D random walks uh, is, uh, is actually correct. So, for now, uh, everything looks nice. You, you end up with uh, distributions that are actually Gaussian. Uh, so everything that, uh, that I've been telling you about this exponential scaling, you will, you will have. Uh, if you correct faster, you will have like sharper Gaussians and exponential scalings of error. But there is a but, uh, there is a particular which, are, uh, which, which is like the bit flips uh, of the transmit. So to understand uh, this, uh, this uh, propagating errors, uh, you need to consider that uh, when you, uh, you, you extract an error syndrome along Q of, uh, of the oscillator, uh, well, we are going to look at the back action on the P quadrature of the oscillator. And in particular, on this uh, modular coordinate here, eta over 2P, and this modular co coordinate corresponds to uh, the, the logical uh, operator. So it's like the X operator, X logical operator. So from this perspective, uh, this interaction is a conditional displacement along P of the oscillator conditioned on the transmon state. Uh, so to, what will happen during the, uh, the interaction is that you, you will get uh, two copies of your GKT state moving uh, opposite directions. But if everything goes well at, at, the, at, at the end of the gate, they recombine and the state uh, returns to, well, not exactly its initial position. Here it was uh, shifted by delta P. Uh, it actually, you can see this on this uh, like uh, time diagram, which will recombine a pi away uh, for this uh, modular coordinate. So that means that you have a, actually a logical flip, uh, like a logical, uh, logical region squadrons are, are represented by these gray stripes. Uh, but, but this logical, uh, logical flip is deterministic, so you can uh, account for it in software. Now, the problem is that if you have uh, uh, a bit flip error, uh, during the gate, at the time of the bit flip, uh, your uh, displacement rate will uh, change, will change sign. So that means that uh, in this picture here, you will change your slope and uh, you will end up uh, at a position along this axis uh, that can be actually anywhere. Okay. And this is actually very bad uh, for several reasons. Um, these errors are bad uh, first because so they can be large and correctable. Uh, then the, the, the probability of such an error uh, doesn't scale very favorably. It's a linear in gamma times the conditional displacement, so the gate uh, time. So that means that even if you improve uh, your transmon or reduce the interaction time, you won't reduce much uh, the errors. And finally, uh, I think something very important is that uh, these errors are completely structureless. Uh, your, your, your final position is uniformly sampled in, uh, in minus pi pi. Uh, and that means that even if you, for instance, concatenate your GKT code in a discrete variable code, 
uh, you will not be able to use anything. You have no knowledge of these errors. They are structureless. That means that your bosonic qubit behaves essentially as a physical qubit. You don't gain about having a, a bosonic qubit starting. Okay. So uh, that brings me uh, to our proposals. I'm going to describe two uh, different proposals, uh, two projects. One was carried out by Christian Siegler here and one by uh, Lev Arkady uh, there. And uh, I'm going to keep their uh, pictures up during the rest of the presentation, not only for the pleasure of uh, having them uh, looking at themselves uh, <laughs> uh, on the screen, uh, but also so that you can uh, imprint their, their faces because they, they are actually both uh, on the postdoc market now. I'm, I'm just saying. <laughs> okay, so uh, first proposal, uh, it's actually the simplest one to implement, probably. So the idea uh, was inspired by another way of doing uh, GKP error correction, uh, which was proposed very early on, and which is now referred to as tin type error correction, even though like the etymology of tin type is not so clear, there are different uh, opinions about this. Uh, and the idea is not to, uh, to use as an ancillary not a two-level system, but rather an ancillary oscillator itself prepared uh, in a GKP state uh, with some parameter, uh, some, uh, some periodicity beta here. Uh, it does not encode logical information. It's, uh, we usually call it a Q-naught state here. Uh, it's just used as a shift detector. And then you interact this with your target oscillator uh, with a quadrature quadrature coupling. So, so, coupling. so here RA is either QA or PA. And what this interaction does is that it will convolve the two uh, probability distribution. Okay, uh, so if you start uh, with a, a target which is uh, shifted by a delta Q here, uh, you again have displacement on the ancilla with multiple copies, and they recombine. And when they recombine, you have mapped your uh, your error syndrome onto the ancilla uh, that you just have to detect, and then apply a feedback kick to the target. Uh, so why is this more robust to error? Uh, well, it's, it's all uh, come, it originates from the error model you have from the, for the ancilla. So here we will assume also quadrature noise on the ancilla at similar uh, rate as the target. And now, uh, if we look at propagation of errors, uh, uh, it, uh, the back action, it will look like this. Uh, so this is back action without uh, error. So your, uh, this is the P distribution of the target. Uh, as you uh, turn on the interaction, you will uh, have a a very, very uh, similar picture as the one I showed here. You will get multiple, co multiple copies of the target along P. Uh, they recombine at the end of the day and you have no, uh, no shift. But now if you have an error on your, on your ancilla in the middle, uh, assuming it is only a small shift of the, of the ancilla along QB, uh, then what it does is only a slight uh, slope change here uh, for uh, your, your target displacement rate. And the various copies will still recombine. And if the, the shift is small enough, they will recombine not so far from where they should. Okay. Uh, so errors do propagate, uh, but uh, they have a much uh, less dramatic impact as when you use a two level system and when you, you switch from E to G, uh, you, you can end up anywhere. So that looks great. Uh, but the problem is uh, okay, small shifts propagate a small shift, but how do you actually prepare this ancilla state? Because if you prepare it uh, based on TLS uh, error correction rounds, uh, then when you prepare it, you may shift it by a large amount, and this will propagate as a large shift of the target. Okay, so we have somehow uh, displaced the problem from, uh, let's say, fault tolerant error correction to fault tolerant uh, preparation. And actually, uh, this will help. It's, it's much uh, much easier, and uh, we propose to to do this preparation based on TLS uh, correction rounds. So this is the full system we consider, uh, a target oscillator, an ancilla oscillator, uh, interacting via a quadrature gate, and then a TLS interacting with uh, the ancilla via a conditional displacement gate. And quadrature noise, quadrature noise, bit and phase shift. Uh, so the, the, the central ideas, there are two. Uh, first, uh, you don't need to perfectly prepare your ancilla. Uh, because you will always interact with your ancilla via the QB quadrature. That means that only QB shifts propagate directly to your target. Okay? PB shifts uh, don't matter so much. They will just blur a bit the error syndromes you extract. Uh, that, that's like measurement errors, but you can mitigate them by repeating um, uh, correction cycles. So you don't need a perfect ancilla. You, you can do with a noise-biased ancilla. 
And in that sense, this is uh, quite, uh, it was inspired by uh, Schrute's paper a few years ago on, on noise bias ancilla. Okay, so you need to prepare the ancilla well only along QB. The second important thing to notice is that during uh, TLS correction rounds, you have QB rounds and PB rounds, uh, you get large QB shifts, so large uh, so bad shifts only during PB uh, correction rounds. So if you alternate them, the worst case is when you get uh, an error of the transmon here during one of the last PB rounds. So what we propose is very simple, is just to reorder the preparation rounds so as to get uh, PB rounds first and QB rounds last. So now if you, are, you have errors during these PB rounds, you will shift uh, the ancilla along QB, but this will be uh, corrected by a further QB round. Okay, fairly simple. Uh, so this is what the, uh, the, the error correction cycle could look like. So a cycle is a extraction of error syndrome of the target, uh, processing and feedback. Uh, it starts with uh, an ancilla approximately prepared in, a, in the Q node state. You have a quadrature gate that is mapping the, the, the target uh, error syndrome onto the PB quadrature of the ancilla, which you can detect, apply feedback to the target, and then reprepare the ancilla with this uh, time asymmetric sequence. And actually, we could do a bit simpler than this. Uh, I didn't tell you how we measure this. Uh, it could be a homodyne detection, but we don't want homodyne detection because it's uh, extra circuitry. Uh, oftentimes, it's not so efficient, but actually, we don't need it uh, because this uh, RPB preparation rounds here, they can yield all the information you need to know what was the prior value of the modular operator PB uh, before you reprepare. So the, the, the idea is simple. If you are capable of taking a state that has any PB value and reprepare it to a known PB value, uh, then that means that uh, you, 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 were able, you, you shifted it from the, the arbitrary value to the known value. And if you look at the total shift you applied, uh, well, you know where you started from. Okay? So in practice, that just means that uh, during this uh, RPB preparation rounds, you just store the output, so the classical outputs of the, of the, of the, the transmon measurements, sum them, and use this as an estimator uh, of, the, of the error syndrome, and you apply a feedback kick uh, with uh, some feedback controller, but like this uh, function F here. Uh, that I will describe a bit later on. And I really like this error correction cycle because uh, it may look complicated because you have many steps, but when you decompose it, it's only based on two uh, quantum gates, uh, a quadrature quadrature gate, which, well, has not been completely demonstrated, but, but close to, I think there are making progress at Yale on this, and otherwise it can be decomposed as, uh, with, as known uh, steps. And then conditional displacement, which, which are also quite easy uh, to, to implement. So I think it's kind of experimentally friendly. It's, uh, it's just like uh, many of these steps, but uh, very simple steps. Um, so now let me dive in a, big, a bit on uh, how to tune the parameters of this, uh, of this cycle, and in particular, the, the feedback displacements when you prepare the ancilla, how do we pick the value of epsilon? So here I'm, I'm recalling the picture I showed you before, uh, diffusion constant, drift velocity, and I told you there was an optimal value for epsilon when you want to minimize the, the, the peak width, uh, which is square root of kappa, uh, so the noise on the, on the oscillators time t round. But actually when you... Uh, you compute the evolution of an ancilla initially uh, completely uh, randomly uh, displaced along QB, and you apply many, many such uh, QB preparation rounds with uh, a value of epsilon, which is uh, supposed to be optimal here with, uh, in blue. Uh, even for a very large number of rounds, uh, you, uh, you don't prepare a good ancilla, actually. The, the, the distribution is still very spread out. Uh, and the reason for this is uh, that with, uh, for a small epsilon, you get very low diffusion constant here. Uh, uh, which means that, uh, so you have poor diffusion and in between peaks in these regions, uh, the drift velocity is actually zero. So that means that you get population trapped in between uh, peaks where you, you would like it to be. Okay? And the way to circumvent uh, this issue is, uh, is simple, it's just that you will vary uh, the applied kickback uh, length, uh, the applied kickback length. You start with long kickback, uh, long kickbacks, so as to generate a lot of noise, a lot of diffusion uh, that will flush out the population from in between uh, peaks. 
And then slowly you run down uh, the value of epsilon down to the optimal value I was mentioning epsilon. And if you do this, and uh, now I'm encoding in color the total number of rounds, uh, you will see that uh, you get a central peak that very well approximates uh, this, uh, this uh, optimal value I was mentioning, that this dashed line here. And then you get tails uh, that are exponentially suppressed as uh, you, increase, uh, you increase the number of Q rounds. And you still need to go to pretty large round numbers. Uh, okay, so what about uh, transmon propagating errors? Uh, I, I didn't uh, talk about them uh, yet. Well, that's because here I was considering the Q distribution uh, during uh, QB round. Okay. Uh, they will actually impact the PB distribution. Okay. So uh, now here I'm plotting for the real preparation. So first uh, 50 uh, PB rounds and then QB rounds. And that's the distribution you get at the end of the day. Uh, you, I already showed you the, the QB distribution. And then as you increase and Q here, the number of Q rounds, uh, your PB distribution degrades. You get uh, tails that come up. This is simply because you have a higher probability for a transmont flip during this, uh, these gates that will randomize the state uh, of the ancilla along PB. Okay? And the central peak deflates uh, due to quadrature noise. So overall, you cannot pick, you cannot prepare with uh, infinitely large number of, uh, of uh, Q rounds. There will be a trade-off uh, because otherwise your your ancilla will be a very poor ancilla. You will not be able to extract uh, error syndrome. Uh, so be, before showing you the final results, our, our uh, error correction fares, let me say a word about uh, the, the simulation that we use here. Uh, so first we will lever leverage the fact that our states under our noise model remains periodic at all times. And that means that it will be diagonal in a particular basis known as a ZAC basis. Uh, and essentially, that means that uh, the ZAC basis, diagonal in the ZAC basis, that means that you can simulate a classical uh, distribution. Uh, it's a distribution of the modular Q and P quadratures I have been mentioning. So you can keep track of a 2D uh, classical distribution. And it gets a bit better than this. You can show that the, the distribution remains separable between Q and P. So now you can keep track of only a classical uh, 1D distribution along Q and 1D along P. Uh, you can go a bit faster by actually simulating its, its evolution not in real space but in Fourier space. Uh, then you, you, you get only uh, Fourier vectors of about 30 coefficients. And finally, as we have a simple uh, feedback scheme, which is short memory, uh, we can encode the whole evolution of target and ancilla in an in evolution matrix uh, which, uh, that encodes the evolution over one correction cycle. Uh, n by n matrix, so 30 by 30, and extract the logical decay rate of the, of the, of the qubit uh, by spectral analysis. And this is fast, and it also allows us to uh, compute a gradient of this, of this rate with respect to the, to the continuous parameters of our protocol. So the, actually the, the kickbacks applied during preparation rounds and also the shape of this, uh, of this function. And if we optimize over all these parameters and also the number of preparation rounds, this is what we get. So that's a central figure of our paper. Here I'm representing the, uh, the logical uh, qubit uh, error rate in units of uh, the round time versus the, uh, the, 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 the quadrature noise rate okay, for various uh, transmon uh, flip probabilities uh, along these various curves. And after optimization, so the, the, the number of, uh, of preparation rounds we use is encoded in color. But the striking feature here is that as you, reduced, as you reduce both uh, the, diff the, the, the quadrature noise rate and the transmont uh, noise rate, uh, then you suppress very robustly, uh, I think exponentially, even if we don't have like analytical proofs, uh, it looks uh, very, uh, very strong suppression of logical errors. Okay. Uh, so that's reducing noise of both the transmon and the oscillators, or equivalently, uh, doing uh, faster uh, rounds. Uh, so that's great. Uh, these numbers may look a bit intimidating because where to, to reach a strong suppression regime, uh, you need uh, quite a good oscillator and transmon to start with. To put numbers, if you, uh, if you have a round time of about one microsecond, which has been uh, demonstrated uh, experimentally, uh, you need uh, uh, 20 millisecond or tens of millisecond uh, long-lived cavities. Uh, so when, I, when we got these results, initially I, I thought that this was going to be hard to, to, to get, uh, not as hard as a pink flush whale, but uh, still harder. Uh, yeah. But actually a few days later, 
uh, I discussed with uh, somebody from uh, Serge Rosenblum's group uh, in Tel Aviv, and uh, they actually uh, made such a cavity, uh, which is 20 milliseconds uh, long, uh, lifetime. And uh, when you look also at state of the art for transmon, like that's about 500 microseconds, if, even if now I think it's a bit, a bit further up, it's, uh, it's right here. So it's right in the middle of this range. That will be something like a factor 100 above break even, of course, would be great, uh, with some margin for improvement. And I want to finish on this. Uh, we have margin for improvement, of course, by getting better hardware. Uh, also, we could refine a bit our uh, feedback protocols. Uh, we could uh, revisit the short memory assumption. Uh, also, this uh, cycle duration is, uh, is totally dominated by the preparation of the ancilla. So maybe you could uh, improve by using multiple ancillas that you prepare and then use uh, uh, on your, on your tag target to multiplex error syndrome extraction. But of course, I want to insist on, on one fact. Uh, this, uh, these results are, were obtained uh, for uh, infinite energy states and with a uh, uh, quite naive noise model, which is quadrature noise. And yet, uh, I think we can transpose the results to more uh, realistic noise models. Uh, we have uh, taken the first steps towards this, and uh, I will also argue about it uh, uh, in, a, in a few slides. Uh, I, I will let you know about so uh, this brings me to the second uh, protocol, which is quite different. And now it's, uh, it was uh, conducted by Leva Kadi, who is watching us from above, uh, from the stars. Uh, and the idea is quite different. It's to revisit the way we interact our uh, ancilla with our, oh my, five minutes. So that's what happens when you talk too much about being flush waves. Uh, I will try to be quick. Uh, to revisit the, the way you interact with your, with your targets. Uh, and uh, so, so what I told you about, about uh, error propagation, uh, you can think about it in another way. They happen because we are actually tricking the system. Uh, we want to extract, measure a modular operator, but we are using uh, a linear coupling. Okay? And we are using uh, the modularity of the qubit uh, so that the overall evolution uh, boils down to uh, measuring a, a modular operator. But if you look at intermediary times, uh, this evolution, it will actually extract information, map information to the qubit, uh, which is about, uh, at this particular time, it will be uh, about the logical operator. Okay? So if you, if you lose a photon at this stage, uh, the environment can acquire this information and measure the logical qubit and trigger uh, logical flips. What we would much rather have is an interaction via directly modular operators uh, matching the, the stabilizers of the code so that at all time, the qubit does not get any information about the logical operators and neither does the environment. So of course, that would be great. Uh, that's a, there is a second advantage is that then you don't need the modularity of the qubit. Uh, so you can replace it with a, a regular uh, mode. And finally, uh, as you don't need to wait for some particular time, you can get rid of this switch here and do continuous error correction. So now the, the, the difficulty is how do we engineer such a Hamiltonian? It's, it's pretty exotic. It's a modular operator in the Hamiltonian. And I, I'm going to try to describe this in the few minutes I have left. Uh, so the idea is, uh, and I want to describe not how to engineer a modular interaction, uh, but uh, directly a modular operator of a single mode to engineer this uh, GKP Hamiltonian here. And uh, trust me, once you have this, it's pretty easy to transpose to get uh, modular interactions. And the idea is the following. You start with a fairly simple circuit, uh, capacitance, inductance, and, and, uh, and junction. Uh, this circuit, uh, so the, this linear part implements an, an harmonic oscillator, which is perturbed by this uh, junction. And what this junction does is by translating uh, Cooper pairs, it will translate uh, this uh, N coordinate, uh, which is the number of Cooper pair by plus or minus one. So first step is, uh, is classic. Uh, you go to reduced uh, coordinates so that the vacuum is, uh, is now uh, uh, has equal fluctuations in Q and P. Uh, and then the junction uh, term in the Hamiltonian is cos eta Q. And to get the eta to the right value for the GKP error correction, uh, you need the right rescaling factor. This is set by the, the impedance of the linear part of the circuit. So you need a, a high impedance mode, uh, more precisely two uh, quantum of resistance, so 13 kilo. Second, you will go to the rotating frame to cancel the linear part of the Hamiltonian here. Uh, and now you have no linear part, but your Josephson term is now rotating. Okay, so it tries to, to implement translations uh, around a rotating axis. 
And now the trick is to replace a simple junction by a split junction uh, so that you can control its effective Josephson energy and you're going to control it in the following way. At time t equals to zero, this orange axis overlaps with Q. Uh, you let, uh, you, you activate the Josephson tunneling. This will start to displace your state coherently uh, at plus or minus eta. Then you, you, uh, you turn it off, you wait for a quarter period until it overlaps with P and you turn it back on. Then you will activate translations along P and so on and so forth. And in the long term, you will have uh, generated uh, a GKP state. That's, uh, that was also like at the same time, there was a proposal from Arnie's group, which I think is very similar, uh, similar ideas. And mathematically, uh, what you show is simply that you take this time varying Hamiltonian, take the average, so it's a rotating wave approximation, and you take, get the GKP Hamiltonian. Okay, so uh, since I don't have much time, I'm going to skip the part about uh, modular interaction engineering, but it's essentially the same protocol with uh, sharp pulses to turn on the Josephson energy, but you modulate the amplitude of these pulses uh, at the frequency of an ancilla qubit. It allows you to, to engineer interaction either along Q or P. And from there, we could uh, revisit the protocols of uh, error correction by feedback, but actually we are more interested in uh, trying to go for autonomous feedback. Since we can continuously extract error syndromes, uh, we prefer to uh, do this autonomously by reservoir engineering. And for, for this, we'll consider actually four dissipators, uh, which corresponds to the, the stabilizers of the code minus one. And we also use properties like that, uh, minus Q or minus P. Okay, I know. Uh, so uh, essentially uh, you can show that the GKP code states are fixed point of these dissipations. And so I will just show uh, this plot uh, that's, uh, we are showing uh, the, the, the logical flip probability uh, versus uh, the, the, some intrinsic noise channel uh, strength. And we can do this for quadrature noise here, and you can still see that uh, as you, uh, you uh, so this kappa is intrinsic noise, this gamma is engineer, engineer noise, uh, engineer dissipation, so it's kappa good over kappa bad of Young, and you can see that logical errors scale down exponentially. But here we can go further and uh, check over noise models, uh, photon loss, pure dephasing, k Hamiltonian, and they all uh, qualitatively show the same behavior. Here I'm cheating a bit because this x-axis has been rescaled by the number of photons in the GKP state, but that sort of a posteriori uh, justifies why we can look at the quadrature noise. Uh, we looked at quadrature noise only. If it works with quadrature noise, there is a good chance it will work for other noise models. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up. Uh, that's how you engineer them. You need frequency combs with a pretty intimidating uh, number of, uh, of uh, teeth, but I still think it's reasonable. We try to work this uh, like uh, quantitatively and, uh, and uh, with state of the art uh, circuits, it should work. And uh, I will just finish by, okay. And now we actually started the project that's my student, Aaron Von Sello working on this. And I will finish by, uh, by thanking you, of course, and uh, mentioning that we have a lot of open positions in Paris, uh, from PhD to postdoc and even a permanent researcher position in uh, experimental uh, physics. So uh, please let us know if you are interested. And thank you again for your attention. Thanks, Felipe. Uh, so we have a couple of minutes for questions. <coughs> Uh, what about uh, what about the phasing errors on the ancilla? Because uh, like you, you are okay doing stuff and that at second order. So you mean on the, the second protocol, right? Yes. Uh, I mean, virtually, if you manage to uh, engineer, the question is, do you, do you exactly get these uh, interactions? But uh, these ones. But if you manage to engineer this, whatever happens to mode B, it will not propagate at the logical level because you only interact with the target oscillator via the stabilizers. So you will only generate evolutions that are generated by this, uh, these operators. And uh, this commutes with, uh, with uh, the, the Pauli operators. So it will not propagate back. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Philippe. So uh, the model or noise that you're using is dissipator of Q and dissipator of P. And that gives you interesting symmetry properties you're in an energy state at all times. Shouldn't be you actually not using that, but using the dissipator of single photon loss instead. But when you write D of Q and D of P, I understand that's the error before the stabilization, right? 
Uh, so on this second, the last plot I showed you, uh, we are actually considering various noise models, uh, so D of Q and D of P, but also photon loss, pure dephasing, uh, and here a care Hamiltonian perturbation, and it works against all these uh, all these uh, all these noise models. For the first part of the talk, I, uh, we only use Q uh, Q and P noise uh, because uh, well, this uh, efficient simulation that I mentioned, you cannot perform them uh, with photon loss. Uh, whereas here we can, because we have a single mode, so we can brute force simulate, sim simulate the system. Mm -hmm. So all these equivalences, these four equivalences, are a property of uh, the stabilization that you're using. The stabilization yes, but uh, the intuition is, I think, uh, these uh, stabilizers that we consider, that's actually what you implement, a discrete time version of it, when you perform a, a stroboscopic uh, measurement and feedback. It's just like the main thing that we don't have here, is propagating errors. But if you don't consider propagating errors from T1 errors of the transmit, I think you implement something very close to this. So you expect uh, very similar results, actually. Thanks. Uh, I have a question about the, the first protocol. You had the quadrature quadrature interaction in there. Yeah. Did you put any noise model on that, or how would you expect that? Uh, so the, you mean the imperfect quadrature quadrature interaction? Uh, yeah, so it's a, it's a good question. The thing is here we are considering uh, infinite, uh, well, I don't need to show anything. We are considering infinite energy states. So if we have even a tiny bit of mismatch in these gates, uh, for instance, uh, uh, like we do not the right prefactor before QA and QB, uh, it will build up uh, as you go further and further away in phase space, and which will be a, so a tiny bit of imperfection and your uh, solver. Okay, so that's, uh, you need to assume very perfect gates in that case. But when you go for uh, finite energy states, uh, then it's much more uh, it's uh, it's much less demanding. As long as your uh, when you do quadrature quadrature and you have a bit uh, you are a bit off, the question is um, uh, does the error at the at the border of the state as far as you can you go in phase space uh, do you get like a logical flip or not? I don't know, I, it's not very clear, but I can uh, discuss with you uh, later on. It's uh, there are arguments to say that uh, for finite uh, energy states, it's, it's much less demanding. Uh, thanks, Philippe, again. Philip, can you start uh, stop the uh, screen sharing? So I cannot take over the screen sharing. Yeah, it says that you cannot take over the screen sharing while 